God. Hallelujah. This is a healing place. This is a healing place. Feel the warmth. There is a, there is This is a healing place Is a healing place There's a warm In these walls Sing it, church. This is a healing place. This is a healing place. It's a warm place within these walls of grace. This is a healing place. Oh, somebody say, This is a healing place. This is a healing place. Oh, there's a warm embrace within these walls of grace. This is a healing place. Oh, this is a healing place. This is a healing place. There's a warm embrace within these walls of grace. This is a healing place. Oh, if you need his touch, lift your hand and say, This is a healing place. This is a healing place. There is a warm embrace within these walls of grace. Receive it. This is a healing place. This is a healing place. There is a warm embrace. Walls of grace. This is a healing place. Hallelujah. Oh, give glory to God. Give glory to God for His divine power. Hallelujah. Amen. Before you're reseated, just go to somebody and say you're glad to see them this morning. You may be the only person that's given them a good word of hope this morning, so go ahead and do it.
Good morning, Victory Church. How's everybody doing this morning? Where's all my young people at? That's all they got left. That's all they got left. Young people, see the person next to you, sleeping, elbow them. And shout out to adults too. If you guys see any adults next to you, sleeping, elbow them too. So. Uh, we had our lock-in last night, our youth lock-in, and it's a fantastic time. Thanks to all the parents that just trust us with your, your, your young people. We loved it. Uh, we had such a, a great, fun time. Um, we, didn't really, we didn't stay up all night. Don't worry. They're, they're more than able to uh, mow the lawn or do something today. Rake the leaves. Uh, <laughs> uh, but welcome to church this morning. We serve an awesome God. Amen? Yes, amen. amen. I got a few announcements for you guys this morning. Um, this Thursday, uh, it's gonna, we're going to have Thanksgiving lunch. So you're invited to the Thanksgiving lunch with the pastor and his family uh, this Thursday, November 28th at 12.30 p.m. here. Um, let Trina know if you plan to attend and bring a side dish. And I was thinking about this, and Emily, if we uh, go to my parents' house at 11, eat, come here at 12.30, eat, and then go to your parents' house around like 3 that's three meals in one day. I'm telling you. take food home. <laughs> sounds fantastic. It sounds amazing. Uh, uh, so be here. Uh, if you want to have lunch with uh, the pastor and their family, it's an amazing thing that they do every single year. Uh, and come, enjoy, and have a good time. Um, Christmas decorating. How many of you already have your Christmas stuff up already? Half of you are Christians. Um, I'm just kidding. Uh, today, everyone say today. Immediately after, ser after service, after church, uh, we'll be setting up uh, Christmas decorations here at the church. Uh, we'll be bringing everything down. So if you can help out, help out in any way, uh, if it's just the part where you're bringing a big Christmas tree down, that's good enough for us. Uh, we just would uh, um, love and enjoy the help. So that's happening today. Um, as we've been announcing, no service uh, this Wednesday, November 27th, and no service on Wednesday, to, uh, December 25th. Enjoy the time with your family and different things like that. Uh, coming up real quick, a, a few things are coming up that we want you to be a part of. Uh, fr Friends and Family Day is coming up. Everybody excited about that? It's going to be awesome. That's December 15th. Mark it on your calendar. Invite your family. Invite your friends. It's going to uh, be just a big day of celebration and where we just get to have fun. Um, and, and I love it. It's awesome. Uh, we give away prizes. We get prizes. Uh, we, we laugh and have a good time, and we still worship God at, all at the same time. So it's a great day. Uh, let Trina know if you'd like to donate any prizes. Uh, and then that evening, you guys excited about the variety show? Yes, yes. I am. I am. I'm super excited. Me um, too. This, <laughs> this past, uh, I think it's this past week, this past Sunday, uh, last Sunday, uh, I know the young adults, we were up here practicing something very special for you guys. Surprise, surprise. Uh, it's coming. Um, and then our youth is doing something big, and it's going to be great. Uh, but that's going to be December 15th at 6 p.m. So that morning at 10 a.m., be here for church, Friends and Family Day, and then come back that evening at 6 p.m. Uh, for the variety show. Uh, and if you uh, can cook chili, super dessert, sign up. It's a fun competition. Uh, and the last thing I have for you this morning, uh, Christmas Eve Family Communion. Uh, this is something we just want to keep talking about because we want you to be here. Uh, it's a great time. Uh, it's a come and go um, type of thing with your family between 6 and 7 uh, that evening. Uh, and just come have communion with you and your family and um, just celebrate God and everything he's done for us. Amen? amen. You guys ready to give this morning? Yes, amen. Everyone give it up for Zach. If the kids are still awake, Charlie, you didn't stay up late enough at a lock-in. <laughs> oh, man. Um, believe it or not, there used to be a time where we used to, like, run, um, whenever a revolution camp was going on, the rec crew just wouldn't go to bed sometimes. And now it's like, I look forward to lights out. Yeah. Like, I look forward to telling the kids to go to sleep. Um, and I know the kids want to sleep, too. That's that's normally how it is. They, they, they get all excited. Well, uh, br uh Brandon has been kind of hitting on things that um, I've also hit on about being thankful. Um, and I said two or three weeks ago that sometimes some of the best prayers you could ever say is just thank you, Jesus. And it really is. And it's still true today. Um, 
And it's 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 funny because uh, you know the kids, the, the the youth nowadays, they won't ever get to to embark on our Veggie Tales adventures. And, and they don't understand the new VeggieTales is not anything close to what VeggieTales used to be. Like, they have weird-looking eyes now and stuff. Like, it's weird. And, uh, but there was a song that reminded me, and I even showed it to Hannah last night. And it was little Junior Asparagus. So he's like, I thank God for seeing it in my dad. Yeah, exactly. So it's the thankful song for, for his, you know, he's in... And the moral of the story was they, you know, the uh, Madame Wazelle Blueberry or whatever her name, she wanted to buy everything, right? And she wanted, she needed everything, and she had to just buy, 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 buy. And then she's looking, and she's getting taught lessons by people who don't have money who are just saying, thank you for what I have. And I think, I think there's a really powerful message there, uh, you know, out of a little asparagus that sings and talks, uh, you know, and... Uh, and, uh, you know, they're just, they're just being thankful, right? And so I was saying that this is my favorite time of year because everybody's nicer. And then, um, you know, everybody seems to be more thankful for what they have and for what's going on. And I went to a man's house uh, four or five days ago. And he said you, he was uh, 78 years old. Um, he had one of the most gorgeous Harley street glides that I've ever seen in my life. And uh, he rides it in a motorcycle group. But he said his, his brother was a, a minister, and his brother had died two years ago in 2017. And he said, I, I, I was just so thankful for the time that I had. I wish that I still had him. So he actually started talking to me. And this is, he had no idea who I was, right, I've never met him, and he started talking to me about how I need to be thankful for everything that I have. And I was just like, wow, like, you know, I was literally, we've been talking about it for the past few weeks. And so he handed me uh, these bracelets that say, thank God on them. And he said, you know, I don't have a big ministry, but I, I pass about $2,000 $2, worth of these a month. He said he's got a fixed income and he spends it on these bracelets. And he says, I go and I give them to people. And I say, you don't have to say much. Just thank God. Yeah. And he said, and you'll be blessed. Yeah. Amen. And that's what, that's what this bracelet says. I've got a few bracelets. That, I, I mean, I, I'm not going to pass them out right now. But I've got a few bracelets that I've been passing out. And, and if, you want, if you want one, while supplies last after church, come find me. I will give you one. Uh, listen, I say while well, supplies, I can't give one to everybody, but it is just a good reminder. If you're in, living in the Plano area, he shops at Tom Thumb, and he said he throws about 100 of them on the shelves so that when people are shopping, they grab them on the shelves. So if you're in that Tom Thumb area, uh, 75093 is the zip code that he lives in. And uh, anyways, but it, what a powerful thing, right? And Man. and And... And I just want to remind you today that as you give, you can be thankful for what you have to give. Yeah. Because if you're not thankful for what you have, you're not going to be blessed with more. That's right. That's right. That sounded way heavier than I wanted it to. But if you're not grateful and thankful for what you have, you're not going to be blessed with right. more. So this morning, whenever you give, be thankful that you can give for what you give so that God will bless you with more than you have. Amen. Amen. Good word. Ushers, if you would come, whatever it is you have to give today. Give thankfully and cheerfully. God, we just want to say thank you for who you are. Thank you for what you're doing. Thank you for sending your son for us. Thank you for waking us up this morning. Thank you for the breath we breathe. God, we just ask right now that you bless each giver and each gift. And we just ask all this in your name. Amen.
God has spoken, and I know that it is so. Amen. Say it out loud with me. God has spoken, and I know that it is so. Say it again. God has spoken, and I know it is so. If God has said anything, if he has spoken something, did you know whether I believe it or not, it still is so? Thank you, son. Whether I believe it or not, it's still so. <laughs> but at some point, I've got to buy into it. At some point, I've got to say yes to his word. You get no divine privileges outside of believing God's divine word. Hallelujah. Amen. You've got to believe his word. Well, I can believe most of it. Then you're living less than what you could be living. Well, I believe some of it. Well, you, you're living in, in less than if you believe it all. Amen. Well, I can believe some of it because it makes sense to me. But the rest of it, it's still so. Amen. God's word is so. His word is forever settled in heaven. His word is forever settled in heaven. Did you know that right now in heaven, God's word is being done to the letter? 100%. Amen. Amen. That's why he taught his disciples to pray. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. On this planet, just like it's being done on your planet. Amen. Do you know heaven's a planet? Yeah. I'll just let that settle for a while. Amen. Praise God. His will to be done. How is his will accomplished? Well, it comes through his word. His word is his will. And so we have to know what his word says and, and not just have a knowledge in our head about it, but we also have to implement it into our lives. Otherwise, it's just wasted ink on paper. It's for no reason. And it is possible for us to take and wrangle and wrestle God's word until we make it of no effect in our life. That is a possibility. So if we run it through our human computer and say, I believe that God's word says this. However, I personally have never experienced it, and many thousands of other people have not experienced it, so it must not be so. So what you're just saying then is made of none effect. Do you see? By his stripes I am healed. Well, that's if it's God's will. Wait a minute. It's in his word, and his word is his so it is God's will. Well, I'm going to get, you, you would never say, well, I'm going to pray and ask God to save me, and then I hope somewhere down the road he will. Would you ever say that? No. No. It makes no sense. It doesn't make any kind of sense to think that or say that or believe it, but yet in the church world we have, we have done that. We've relegated some of the things of of God to be an, an okay thing to believe, and some of the things of God not so much an okay thing to believe because it's not cool, it's not hip, it's not popular. Holiness is still, is still cool. It's still God. Amen. may not be popular, <laughs> but it's still God's plan. Amen. Praise the Lord. And today we're celebrating uh, a good time of the year, Thanksgiving. Everybody say, Thanksgiving. Thanks is forgiving. Amen. We give thanks with a grateful heart. As one of my acquaintances in the past wrote a song, you've probably heard it. Give thanks with a grateful heart. Give thanks to the Holy One. Give thanks because he's given Jesus Christ his son. Amen. What a powerful, powerful word. 
But uh, how many of you, you don't, don't raise your hand, don't nudge your neighbor or your husband or your wife or whoever's sitting beside you, but how many of you could use uh, your life changing for the better? <laughs> Amen. How many, how many of you could stand a little bit of life change that would just, man, it would just be a good thing? Well, let me tell you how that happens. If you will put your nose in the Bible, <laughs> If you'll put your nose in the Bible, your life will change for the better. Thank you for that one amen somewhere over in here. Hallelujah. If you'll put your nose in the Bible, your life will change for the better. And the reason our lives are so difficult is because of a lack of daily, continuous, disciplined study in the Word of God. That's why our lives become difficult. You... Listen to me carefully. Listen. If, if you don't listen carefully, you'll misunderstand. You'll go out of here and say, I don't believe or I do believe certain weird things. But listen to me carefully. You don't need a prophecy or a word from a human. Do I believe in prophecy and words from humans? Yes. I do not despise prophecy or prophesying. I detest prophelying. <laughs> detest it. I hate, I hate prophet fishing. That's a word I made up. Prophet fishing. I see that you've got somebody in your life. Their name is Charles. No, not Charles. No, Chan. Chan. Well, it starts with a C-H. Well, no, nobody in my. Well, it's, that's, that's right. It's John. See, I hate prophet fishing. I've been there. I've watched it happen. That, that you know, either God can or God can't. Let's choose one. Amen. And uh, so I don't need a human to give me a word, although when it comes, thank God. But it's not how I live my life. I live my life by God's written word. Amen. The word from the word from God. Only this book can and will change your life for the better. Say this with me. God's word is God speaking to me. God's word is God speaking to me. I wish I could hear God. I, I've just been begging God to let. Well, when I open it, I don't. Amen. Amen. God's word is God speaking to me. Praise the Lord. Wednesday evening I talked to you about um, uh, being careful what we hear. We talk so much about the parable of the sower and so much emphasis is placed on us. The preparation of the soil. We're the dirt. We're the soil in that thing. And so everybody's trying to make your, uh, get our dirt to get better. We're trying to put nutrition in our human dirt. Some way or another, if I can make myself better, then God's word somehow will work and be more effective. The problem is not the dirt. The problem is the hearing. Because in all four dirt styles in the book of Mark, which is chapter 4, I believe, and Luke 9, I believe, is the second place that it's mentioned, all four of those soil types, when they're talked about, has to do with hearing. Hearing. You just got to be careful what you hear. Amen. So get in God's word and you'll hear. Now, Thanksgiving Day, I want to talk about that for just a few moments here. It's just a few days away and then boom, Christmas. You ready? How many of you finished shopping? Excellent. <clears throat> How many of you haven't started? Same. Praise the Lord. Amen. I've started shopping in my mind. Right. And um, I hear one word in my spirit, Amazon. It just keeps coming to me <laughs> because, not that I'm going to go there or anything like that, but um, that um, it's easier to bring it to my house than for me to go get it. <clears throat> but the day that we know as Thanksgiving has an interesting history. From 1621 and Plymouth Rock and the Pilgrims and the Native Americans and, and all of those things um, till the present, till today, it's got a long and a varied history. I'm just guessing, uh, but there were probably no pumpkin pies as we know them 
at that first Thanksgiving. Probably no green bean casseroles. I'm just guessing. I don't know. Sweet potatoes with marshmallows. Was marshmallows even invented at that point? I don't even know. Uh, some of you that know foodies, maybe you know when marshmallow was invented. And, um, but I'm thinking 1621 was pre-marshmallows baked on top of sweet potatoes. I know sweet potatoes were invented then because um, they've been here a long time. Um, probably no iced tea. No, no, probably not any iced tea. Um, and probably no Cowboys playing football on TV uh, because I think it was a couple of years before electricity had been harnessed by <clears throat> a man who had not even been born at the time. So I'm thinking it was a lot. And there was, since there was no electricity, guess what they didn't have, guys? Can you believe this? They didn't have Wi-Fi. I know. How did they exist? How did those people gather in the same space and sit there and look each other for more than 10 minutes without going to the phone to check to see what was trending in London or Hollywood or anywhere besides Plymouth Rock? I mean, how is it that we... We, we can't go, and I, when I say we, I mean y'all mainly, not me, but mainly, you know, it, it's me as well. It, 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 we can't go anywhere. We, it, we, we start doing something. We start going, you know, we're at a restaurant or whatever, and immediately we've got to check and see something, um, you know, because we, it's just uncomfortable to even talk to the people we love. We, can, we can't look them in the eye for more than 10 seconds. It just gets weird. I'm way off topic here. Or am I? But the day Thanksgiving was not a national holiday for quite a while. Now, the Thanksgiving that we know... Now, George Washington proclaimed a day actually... Of fasting and prayer. Wow. <clears throat> that sure is not Thanksgiving. <laughs> but that's what he declared was a day of fasting and prayer and church going. But who wants to do that on Thanksgiving? Um, <clears throat> our country can't be in that much trouble right now, can it? <laughs> but... Um, the Thanksgiving we know and understand was created primarily by the probably the worst event in American history, the Civil War. Um, the, the, the Thanksgiving that we understand and know now came about due to events in the Civil War. President Lincoln was in the throes of pain in this nation and, and in also in his home as well. Based on historical accounts and records, his wife had some sort of a mental instability that caused a lot of problems in their marriage and in their home. And uh, just a year, but not, in fact, just a few months before he proclaimed uh, uh, Thanksgiving a national holiday or said that we would celebrate this uh, as a national holiday, you know, he didn't sign it into law, he just made the proclamation. Uh, it was not till years later it got signed into law, but he made the proclamation uh, just a few months before this proclamation of Thanksgiving. His 11-year-old son died, and um, so um, how many of you know what civil war is? <clears throat> None of us know because we've never lived in it. Uh, we've seen it all around us, and we've read accounts of it, but. Let me just summarize it by saying civil war is internal, unresolved conflict fought to the death. Internal, unresolved conflict that gets fought to the death. That's what a civil war is. Internal, unresolved conflict. Did you know each individual can have a civil war in their own self? unresolved conflict internally makes you angry at everybody else 
and makes you not want to give thanks for anything. And um, so it was during this time, and, you know, somebody in a civil war is going to come out on the side of getting killed, and other people are going to live. That's in any war. But it creates a scar, creates a wound. At this point, whenever he declared this, over 50,000 people had been horribly disfigured or dismembered, and more than 8,000 were dead from just one of the many wars or battles, which was Gettysburg, just a few months earlier than the proclamation. You know, I hear some of the most ridiculous things today in our nation. I hear it and, and from, from everyone. From, it doesn't make any difference who it is, whether they're Christian or not. I hear ridiculous things coming up. I hear our nation has never been more divided than today. That's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. It's crazy. Things today are worse than they've ever been, really. Things are so bad, I, I've heard this, uh, things are so bad that only the rapture of the church will fix it. Is your son in a military campaign shooting guns at and killing his own family members? That's what they were doing during the Civil War in 1863 when he signed this, or whenever he talked about Thanksgiving, Lincoln I'm talking about. How is today's state of the nation worse than ever, if that's the case? Are you having starvation? How many of you have sent out invitations for your next starvation party? Any of, anyone? Because what they were doing is they would have parties and gather together to get some respite from the war, but because there was no food, they called them starvation parties. So they'd go hang out with each other without Wi-Fi, and they would play games and have fun, but there was no food to eat. In fact, the reason that turkeys even became a part of it was because they were having to take boatloads of them because there was no food for the troops to eat, and they were surrounded, and they couldn't get anything, and so the reason they... Uh, uh, the turkeys became so popular, they would take them uh, via boat uh, and get into the ports where they could give it to the troops, and the troops would even distribute uh, to the locals in the area, in the cities where th that were surrounded, so that they'd have something to eat, because someone had scattered all the pigeons, because that was their meat. So they would have starvation parties. Our nation right now is worse than it's ever been before. Absolutely not. Absolutely not. That's what was going on. They just try to get some respite. The Congress and the Senate were so divided that they were secretly, and some of them openly, trying to sabotage and assassinate each other. We do know that Lincoln got assassinated after the fact, but even while this mess was going on, they weren't just trying to kill each other politically. They were trying to actually kill each other. I'm talking murder. And um, so what did he do? What did Lincoln do during the worst divided period of time ever in the history of America? What did he do? He said, why don't we um, call on God? And so here's his words. Uh, it probably seems odd that Lincoln would choose this moment to announce a national day of thanksgiving to be marked on the last Thursday in November. His October 3rd, 1863 proclamation read like this. These are his words. In the midst of a civil war of unequaled magnitude and severity, peace has been preserved with all nations, order, has been maintained and laws have been respected and obeyed and harmony has prevailed everywhere except in the theater of military conflict. So there was peace on the outside, but there was horror on the inside. And in the midst of peace on the outside and horror on the inside, Lincoln said, why don't we take a day and stop this nonsense? Now, how many of you know that one day of Thanksgiving is not enough to stop an internal war? 
It's got to be an ongoing thing. Now, let me just say that it was not until November 26, 1941, that Franklin Delano Roosevelt signed a bill declaring that the fourth Thursday of November would be Thanksgiving Day. So it took some years. So from 1621 till 1941, as I calculate, 16, 17, 18, it was three, 400 years before it ever got signed into a, a bill. But thank God we have a day. And I want to talk to you about always giving thanks. Always giving thanks. Trina and I have a sign hanging on our wall as you go into our kitchen, and it says, There is always, always, always something to be thankful for. I have a picture of it. I don't know if they were able to get it to come up. Wouldn't come up? All right. Did the other one come up? Okay, good. But this sign, it says, There is always, always, always something to be thankful for. And um, we can be thankful even in the midst of horrific situations. A lot of times because of our faulty understanding of the Word of God, we often find it hard to give thanks. We incorrectly believe and practice being thankful when good things happen. That's a faulty understanding of who we are in Christ, by the way. In other words, in our lives, if God will answer a prayer then we thank him, or we'll say, thank God that that happened. But that my understanding of proper theological uh, protocol, as it were, is that we thank God before he answers the prayer. <laughs> thank you for the cough or sneeze. That was awesome. And uh, that, that's, a, that's an encouragement to me. That means you said amen. <laughs> Praise the Lord. But... Sometimes only when a relationship is stored, restored, then we say thank you. Because our, 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 humanist, our humanistic tendency is to say, if you'll perform for me, then I will give you a pat on the back. I'll give you an attaboy. Well, that's an incorrect way to view God. If you view God that way, you'll probably never receive very much from him. That's, that's not the way it's done. It's a sure sign of not really trusting in the love of Jesus if you only praise him or thank him after the answer has come. So we've been conditioned as Christians to believe that God helps those who help themselves. And let me say for the record, that's not in the Bible. But it is true to an extent that we're responsible for our lives. Now, I don't have time to get into that. I've, got, I've taught hours on that subject and I do believe we're responsible for our lives but it is not true that God only does good things for perfect people it's not true in fact my Bible says he sends rain to the just and the unjust so it just lets me know that God's just a good God all by himself without my interference <laughs> amen he's a good God and uh but if I'm good enough, this is what we think, if I'm good enough, if I read my Bible enough, I go to church enough, then I'll be first in line when God's handing out free clothes, groceries, money, and healing. Somehow my petition will get to number one on the list because I've been a good boy. And because I've been a good boy, I get first dibs at whatever it is that God's dealing out a little bit at a time. The opposite of that is also a part of our bad theology. The opposite of that is, is God's got all this stuff in his hands and because I sinned last week or last year, God has closed his hand and he's teaching me a lesson. He's allowed me to be sick. He's allowed me to be broke. He's allowed me to be humiliated because I have not kept my good Christian behavior in check. And in fact, God is in some weird way actually putting this bad stuff on me because he's upset with my stupid behavior. It is true that stupid behavior will get you into serious trouble. Can I get an oh, wow? We all know stupid behavior gets us into serious trouble, right? It is true. Sin is stupid. How many of you would agree sin is just stupid to sin? It's a stupid thing to do. It's not ignorant. It's stupid. It's one thing to ignore it and just go ahead, but it's stupid if you just go, you know what, I'm just going to do it. Sin is stupid. It's stupid. But here's some good news. It will damage, it will make your life miserable, but God is not mad at you. Stupid. He is not mad at you because sin is stupid. 
Amen. It's designed to kill you. It's not designed to help you. God is for you. He's not against you. He loves you. He loves me in spite of me. Thank God. So we've got to learn the essence of being thankful. And I ran across this graph, and I think it explains a whole lot to me, at least, about the current state of our nation. And, what it, ha and, and it has to do with being thankful. And I want to show you this graph. You see this graph here? I don't have time to explain it this morning. But from the 1800s until, here's the 2000s over here on the right-hand side. And these are all the known times the word thankful is mentioned in any newspaper, article, magazine, book, or any writings in America. So here we are at 1800, coming out of the War of Independence, 1776. So you come up here to 1800. 1820, it starts going up. 1860, if you'll look right between 1860 and 1880, around 1865, where the Civil War is, more books, more articles, more people in writings using the word thankful than at any other time in our nation's history. The worst period of our American history. And then look at 1960 to 1980. The years when our nation expanded economically and intellectually the 60s. Everybody gripes about the children of today. Do you know where that, those seeds were planted? <laughs> Don't gripe at the kids, darling. No, 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 no. Gripe at the parents. <laughs> Amen. And, and it dipped in the 60s to the 80s. It's just now coming up a little bit. Don't that say a, Now I don't know what that does to you, but that's interesting to me. That as a whole, our books, our articles, our newspapers, our writings, the things that intellectual people and not so intellectual people write have less to do with thanks, thankfulness and thanksgiving than at any other time of, of history. We have more. Things are better. Everything. But we have less to be thankful about. Doesn't that say a lot? But thank God I like this graph because it's on the rise. It's on the rise. Amen. Now, I, I don't want to take a whole lot more time but I've got to get this in your in your thinking I want you to go with me to Matthew chapter 14 and verse number 13 and I'm going to read a story and we'll make a few comments about it and I believe God is going to touch our hearts and lives now this same story is known as the feeding of the 5,000 you will also find it in Mark chapter 6 verses 30 through 44 you will also find it in Luke 9 10 through 17 but we're going to Matthew uh, 14, 13 through 21. And I'm going to be reading from the nearly inspired version, the NIV, because actually it renders it probably in one of the most easy to read and best ways uh, out of most of the translations. It's not the only translation, but it's a good one. So Matthew chapter 14, verse 13 says, When Jesus landed, he had been in a boat. He saw a large crowd, and he had compassion on them, and he healed their sick. Why didn't he tell them they needed to get saved first? I don't know. Maybe because he's God, and he can do whatever he wants to. How does that sound? Amen. But as evening approached, the disciples came to him and said, This is a remote place, and it's already getting late. Send the crowds away so they can go to the villages and buy themselves some food. Wasn't that nice of them? Jesus replied, they don't need to go away. You give them something to eat. Their response, we have here only five loaves of bread and two fish. What did Jesus say? Well, bring that here to me. And he directed the people to sit down on the grass, taking the five loaves and the two fish and looking up to heaven, he gave thanks. Broke the loaves. Then he gave them to the disciples, and the disciples gave them to the people, and they all ate until satisfied. 
taking the two loaves and two fish, I'm going to read the same little uh, line in Mark chapter 6 so you can see all of it. Taking the five loaves and the two fish and looking up to heaven, he gave thanks and broke the loaves. That's found in Mark chapter 6, 32. Uh, taking the five loaves, this is, this is in Luke chapter 9, the three places it's mentioned in the Bible. Taking the five loaves and the two fish and looking up to heaven, he gave thanks and broke them. All three places, same identical thing. Then he gave it to his disciples to distribute to the people, and they all ate until satisfied. Notice this. Jesus was in an impossible situation. Oh, I know you say, well, he was Jesus, and so it just didn't matter. Well, did you know Jesus did his miracles as a man? Did you know, everybody said, well, no, I don't know about that. Yeah, he was all man, but he was all God. But when he was here on this earth, he received the Holy Spirit when he was baptized in the River Jordan. And at that point, when Jesus said, this is my beloved son, hear ye him, that's when his miracles started. His miraculous, miracle work and power did not still, uh, start until he was filled with the Holy Spirit that day. And likewise, our ministry doesn't start till we're filled with the Spirit because we minister out of overflow, not reserve. Amen. And so Jesus had this in him, but as a man, he was in an impossible situation. It was an impossibly large crowd, about 5,000 men, and who knows how many women and who knows how many children. Some theologians say up to 15,000 or more were in that crowd. But let's just say there were only 5,000. Let's just say there were 45 people and you only had two fish and five pieces of bread. Let's just say it was me and Emmett and there's only two fish and five. That's, somebody's going to go home hungry. It ain't going to be me, but I'm just saying. It, you see what I'm saying? The impossibility of the situation, if it had been five or 5,000, the situation was impossible. It was an impossible situation. Secondly, it was an unusually out-of-the-way remote village. They were literally in the middle of nowhere. So says the scripture. We just read it. We just read it. It said that it was, it, the disciples said, hey, this is a remote place. In other words, they were trying to inform poor uninformed Jesus where they were. Number one, they said, can't you see there's 5,000 people here? Send them away. As though Jesus is uninformed about the situation. Boy, it sounds like most of my praying, Derek. <laughs> Lord, I'm just here to inform you how serious this situation is. You see the impossibility of it, God, and you know that if you don't help me, things are really going to go to south, and, and I'm not saying this in a bad way, but I'm probably going to blame you for it. <laughs> Amen. I'm probably going to say, well, in some off-the-cuff way, I'll eventually figure out why it's his fault, not mine. That's what the disciples were doing. They were putting it off on him. They said, let's, let's just send them away. Impossibly large crowd, out of the way. There's no, in other words, their, their thinking was, this is an out-of-the-way place. Even if you sent us 12, can you imagine the enormity of the task of getting enough food to feed these people? This is not going to happen. There is no possible way for this thing to happen. The other thing was impossible timing. Because the Bible says that evening was approaching. How many of you know when you got 5,000 people out on the side of the hill and there's no electricity or Wi-Fi invented yet, because Benjamin Franklin is not for 2,000 years. There's, anyway, uh, no, there's no electricity. There's no Wi-Fi. There's no nothing. It's dark out there. You're in a remote village away from anywhere. Night is coming on. You're out of time. I've prayed that prayer before. God, can't you see what time it is? I don't think this is going to happen. Come on. And so out of time, getting dark, too late for human intervention. And so what was the human disciple answer to this? Send them away. That's what. There's nothing we can do. And by and large, that's what the church has done to people who are sick and, 
and hurting and in pain. And we've decided that it's just easier, you know, if God wanted to, he could just do it, but it's not going to help them to be here. Well, yeah, it's going to help them to be here. It's going to help them to be here. Can you say amen? And you see, we, it's that old theology. There's nothing we can do. Why? Well, we are nothing. We have nothing. We can do nothing. Even Jesus himself with, said, without me, you can do nothing. But guess what? You'll die praying that kind of prayer. You will die. That's garbagey prayer. That's rotting theology. You know, the bread and the fish in this story is just incidental. It's just incidental. They had everything they needed, but their theology crippled them. They were hung by their tongue. They couldn't see past what was going on in the physical realm. Yeah, it's true. It's true. They didn't realize we have the one thing that we need. And he's right here with us. He's right here with us. We have the one thing. We, the fish, incidental. The bread, incidental. He could have gotten whatever. I mean, they, might, they could have had some other food source. I've been over there. Uh, they could have had falafel. I don't know. They could have had, they could have had shawarma. I don't know what, they, what all they might have had back then, but they had a couple of fish and some bread, and it was sufficient. He could have taken anything and multiplied it. But they were with Jesus, so they were not without him, and neither are you and I. In the impossibilities of our life, we still have Jesus. Can you say amen? And he's all we need. So we got to get out of those poor thinking habits because it forms a lack of knowing God and we're, we have no thanksgiving. And it's interesting to me, uh, this pressure of time on them caused them to think that there was an impossibility. And then there was an impossible lack. Five loaves, two fish, insufficient for 5,000 people, like I said earlier. It's insufficient for even 13 people, you know, like 12 disciples and Jesus. That's not enough for them. So what did Jesus do? He didn't throw his hands up. He didn't say, this is over. I guess I'll just cave in to the people around me because they told me, might as well just give up and send them away. So I'm just going to listen to them. After all, there's wisdom in counselors. Not dumb ones, there's not. Not counselors who don't believe in the word. They believe, they, the word was standing there face to face with them, and they didn't believe in the word. Hallelujah. All three gospels say that he looked up instead of throwing his hands up. He looked up. So the, the thing for us to do in that impossible situation is to quit looking at people. Well, everybody says that this is the way. Yeah, but what do you say about what God's word has said about you? I don't care what other people say. I don't care if well-meaning Christians. I don't care if one of the, if one of the most famous, loved Men of God speak to you and say, well, now, honey, you know that God's word used to work like this, but now that's over. I don't care how popular that man is. I don't care how much biblical training he's had. I don't care how much cemetery he's been to. That is not what God's word says, darling. And I'm going to believe what God's word says regardless of what another human says. Can you say amen? Amen. Glory to God. Quit looking at the people. Quit looking at the pain. Quit looking at the lack. Quit looking at the impossibility. Rather, look up. And after you look up, what do you do? All three gospels said, and he, looking up to heaven, gave thanks. He looked to heaven instead of the circumstances, and we've got to do the same thing. In an impossible situation, quit, in, quit looking at the impossibilities. Start looking to Jesus, who is, by the way, the author and the finisher of your faith. He gave thanks, not for the bread. He gave thanks, not for the fish. He gave thanks, not for the bad situation. Oh, I've heard that one. Well, you know, we just got to praise God for this awful situation. Then why do you want it to change? If God brought it, why don't you get the maximum pain out of your suffering? 
Why do you take Tylenol? If you think that it's God's will for you to be in pain, if you think it's God's will for you to be broke, if you think it's God's will for you to hurt, why don't you just sit down and get the maximum benefit out of God's punishment rather than crying and calling me and asking me for $100 to pay your bill? Hallelujah. Why don't you get the maximum pain out of your suffering for Jesus? Really? I know, it's awkward. I, I thank you for that wonderful whatever it was. Just give glory for that awful situation you're in. Praise God. I know God's allowing it because he's going to get the glory. If that's true, he must have some sadistic pur pur purposes. That's awful theology no matter how you look at it. But Jesus, thank God, who is always, always, always faithful. He gave thanks at some of the most strange events. If you look up Jesus in situations and in the awful, horrific situations of life, did you know he did not take those five loaves and those two fish and go, um, God, you see... There's 5,000 people here. And you see my watch. Which is not making much sense because it's just a, a, a sundial and the sun's going down. I don't know what time it is, but I know it's late. Uh, we're out of time. And there's five loaves of bread and two fish. There's 5,000. Can you see this situation? And, and if it be thy will... Could you multiply this in such a way that it would feed all these people and, and uh, you know, just a miraculous, I can't do anything about this. You've got to do it. And then did he open one eye and look to see if it had multiplied? And maybe there was four, seven or eight loaves there. Whoops, that's not enough. Lord, okay, now you see, that's not enough. He opens his eyes, there's 20, uh, that's not enough. We're going the right direction, but that's not enough. You think he was doing that? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. I don't think that bread multiplied at all. I don't think the fish multiplied at all until the disciples got it in their hands. And as they were breaking it and handing it out, it just multiplied supernaturally because there was enough provision in God's word God said distribute this and they obeyed him and distributed and things changed there's always something to be thankful for Jesus just simply thanked God it didn't say he asked him for a thing how did the bread and fish multiply if he didn't ask if he didn't beg if he didn't twist God's arm how did it happen because we know based on our history, if we beg and twist God's arm, things happen. How is it that Jesus didn't do that and he got an answer? You know I'm being facetious, right? And yet our theology cripples us and we, it, it, we wonder why we don't get answers. Now, I know I'm out of time, but you've got to hear this. Lazarus had been dead for four days. How many of you know that's out of time? You talk about bad timing, There's, that's just not good timing. That's bad timing. And when he finally got, when Jesus finally got to Lazarus' home, there was a huge crying, bawling, wailing, faithless, unbelieving, horrified crowd gathered at his sister's house. How many of you know when you walk into a room and you feel the overall energy is a real downer, you just kind of want to leave? You know, if I'd have been Jesus, I'd have said, you know what? See ya. <laughs> Good thing I'm not him. I mean, these people were crying and wailing. Read the story. I'm not going to read all of it. But the unbelief was overwhelming in that group. And you say, well, yeah, he was dead. <laughs> yeah, he was dead. And, you know, this is the story, and this is the part of the story where it says that Jesus wept. You know, and I, I've heard preachers preach. He was just full of sorrow, and he couldn't believe he was dead. I'm like, 
why are you even preaching? <laughs> Nobody has hope with that kind of theology. Come on. I, a couple of verses later, it says that he was deeply moved once more. The same story. I don't really know and nobody knows and, and there's so many sermons preached on the two words Jesus wept that it is chaotic. If you start reading that stuff, it's just chaotic. Nobody knows what it just goes. Everything becomes allegorical. Everything becomes mystery. Everything, instead of just the fact that he shed a tear, it becomes all of this ethereal stuff you can't put your hand on. I think he was probably saddened by the people that were crying. Have you ever been in a room with people that were crying? You really didn't know what they were crying about, but you started crying? You're like, this is sad. I'm not sure why, but I think I'll shed a tear to help them. <laughs> I don't know. I've been there. Have you ever been in a room, somebody's laughing, and you, <laughs> why are we laughing? <laughs> but you, you get tickled, same thing. Don't even know why. Now, I'm not saying that Jesus didn't know why, but I think he was really moved over the scene that was happening. I'm sure there was some sorrow over the fact that Lazarus is dead, but I, I can't see that that's why Jesus wept. I don't think Jesus wept because Lazarus was dead. I think he wept because they didn't believe that he could raise him from the dead. That's a whole different story. If Jesus already knew that he was the resurrection and the life, because he said those words to Martha in just a verse or so after that if he already knew that coming into this scenario he was not crying because Lazarus was dead Lazarus being dead was incidental to this story our human condition is incidental to the story your circumstance is incidental to the story of your life circumstances come and go Jesus remains the same our thanksgiving has to be based on who he is and what our relationship to him is and our relationship to his word, not our individual circumstantial events in our life. Because all of us could sit up here. If I was to get all of us up here and say, okay, tell us your sad story. Within 10 minutes, everybody in this room would be going, hmm, this is horrible. Because every one of us have a sad story to tell. But I choose not to tell a sad story. I choose to believe in God. I choose to believe there's life after death. Come on. Amen. I choose to believe that there is a God. I, I choose to believe that I, I'm not going to be a part of that overwhelmed, unbelieving crowd. I, I am not going to be a part of that group. Does it make me sad when people leave this planet? Yes, it makes me sad. But I am not going to live my life based on that sadness. I cannot, you cannot, you must move. You must go beyond that. And uh, so even though he was deeply moved, you see, God does not take pleasure in sickness or in death. In fact, he died on the cross to save us from those things. So there's no way he can enjoy it. He went through all of that on the cross so that we could be saved and healed and delivered. What in the world sense does it make that he wants us to be that way? I'm, doing, I'm preaching better than you're saying amen. You're either not getting it or you're just like, I don't believe that because that's not what I've been taught. But it's how Jesus is. That is who he is. And Jesus said that, Jesus said that it is finished. You've heard me preach this before. It is finished. And so all of those things were taken care of at Calvary. So what did Jesus do in this impossible situation with Lazarus? So they took away the stone. Then Jesus looked up because he had been looking at all these other unbelieving, overwhelmed people. And he said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me. But I said this for the benefit of the people standing here that they may believe that you sent me. Oh, I thought that I... I thought the whole point of the story was is that if I cry and wring my hands enough and act like Martha and Mary and the unbelieving group, that Jesus will somehow, in spite of me, come and resurrect this situation. No, he said the reason that he said what he did, the reason that he's prayed what he's prayed, is so that they would believe that God sent him. 
So the key is to believe in Him no matter what your circumstances look like, even if death is the circumstance. Can you say amen? Somebody's getting it. Glory to God. And he did not say, God, if it be thy will, would you please make this dead man get up out of this tomb? Because if not, I'm going to look foolish. If not, this is going to be a bad day. If not, these people are going to... He didn't say any of that. He didn't say, God, don't you know how late it is? The boy's been dead four days. Couldn't we have done something earlier? God, if you, if you really loved Lazarus, like you said, like you say you love all of us, why didn't you just go ahead and keep him alive in the first place? That's the, that's the thing. That's where a lot of people's faith are. Here's the situation. Here's the situation. Even in the midst of this horribleness, Jesus' intent was so that we would believe that he is who he says he is. And it says here that Jesus just simply shouted in a loud voice. In fact, it says Jesus shouted in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out! And the dead man came out, his hands and feet wrapped with strips of linen and a cloth around his face. Jesus said to him, take off the grave clothes and let him go. Take off the grave clothes and let him go. Matt, if you would come this morning. And so the same identical impossibility was in the feeding of the 5,000, the Lazarus being raised from the dead, all of those things. Jesus did the same thing. In both of those situations, he, did, he looked up, but he didn't stop there. He gave thanks. And I'm telling you today, in the midst of your bad situation, this is a time of thanksgiving. In the worst time in our nation's history, people were more thankful than they are today. When in, in, in history, we have more in this age than we've ever had before. And so we, it's time for us to say, Father, I thank you that you hear me. Instead of saying, I wish God would hear me when I pray. God is hearing you when you pray. God is hearing you when you pray. It just may be that there's nothing to answer. Yeah. Because we're praying the problem. We're telling, we're, we're telling God how bad the problem is. And when you tell God how bad the problem is, that doesn't inform him. He's got all that information. You're wasting your breath. I'm, I'm trying not to be ugly, but you're wasting your breath informing God how bad your situation is. Amen. I thank you that you've heard me. When he prayed this prayer of thanksgiving, there was no mention of death. There was no mention of impossibilities. He didn't say, oh God, you know the need. If it be your will, it's just wasted prayer. It's not even a prayer. But he was building his people up. Those that were around him, he was building them up in faith and getting them to trust in God who never fails. And when he thanked God, then he spoke to the problem. And the problem was death. And he said, Lazarus, come out. And when he did that, it happened. There's always, always, always something to be grateful for. So we got to start thanking God instead of accusing him of torture and death, sickness and pain. Realize that we're not telling poor, uninformed God about our situation. Instead, tell the situation how good and powerful your God is. Amen? I'm doing you better than you, than you realize. I want you to stand. You've been sitting for a long time. Let's stand. There's a guy that I know, I've I've known of him for many, many years. He pastors a great church in Fort Worth, Texas. Great pastor, great man of God. His name's Pastor Bob Nichols. And uh, you may have heard him on the radio. He had a daily radio program for 30 some odd years. Powerful man of God. And um, he's been in ministry probably at least 50 years now. And for 30 years of that, he had worked so hard building the kingdom of God over there. And so many good things, so many unbelievable things had happened. Um, But about, and I'm not exactly sure on this timing, but around 15, between 15 and 20 years ago, let's say 16 or 17 years ago, two tornadoes came through Fort Worth and completely destroyed that building he had built. It took him 30 years to build that thing. And in 30 seconds, he lost it all. Wow. 
In fact, they had a prayer tower out front, and there were some women in the church in that prayer tower praying. And the entire church got destroyed, but not the prayer tower. Isn't that something? Isn't that something? But anyway, everything he had worked for in 30 years of ministry was destroyed in 30 seconds. In 30 seconds. And um, then one of his daughters was uh, in a severe car crash. It was a horrible situation, and it left her brain dead. And so for about the past, I don't know how many years, 12, 14 years, um, they have had to have someone in their home to care for her 24 hours a day. And um, the doctor says she's brain dead, but they pray over her every day. And she gets up and she gets on a treadmill and works out with the help of somebody and mutters a few words, but the doctors still say she's brain dead, but she's improving. It's, did I say 12 to 14 years of this is going on in this man's home? And um, one day Bob had a guest speaker at his church. And uh, the guest speaker was preaching about Thanksgiving and that it's all there's always something to be thankful for. There's always something to be thankful for. Always something to... He, he, he preached, he said, God is not the author of sickness. God's not the author of car wrecks. He's not the author of disease. He's not the author of pain. He's not the author of failure. That's not who God is. And he kept encouraging the church to always thank and praise God no matter what the circumstance. Now, how many of you know that everybody in that church knew the situation Brother Bob was in? This church had around has around 1,500 or so people in it. So everybody that was there knew the situation. It was well publicized. Everybody knows about it. And so could you imagine the concern if you were sitting here and there was another man up here and that had been going on in mine and Trina's life and there was another man up here saying, there's always something to be thankful for. You might not be saying amen as much because you'd be out of the side of your eye, you'd be looking at me. Could you imagine what these people were going through as this guest speaker was preaching and saying there's always some, and not the author of car wrecks, not the author of sickness, not the author of pain, and not the author of disease. Don't you think that that had some sort of pressure in those people's minds? And as that guest speaker was saying all these things, Brother Bob Nichols stood up with his Bible in his hand, and he threw it across the room, and he screamed out loud, I cannot take this anymore. I've just got to praise God. I've just got to thank Him. I can't stand this anymore. God is so good. He's a great God. There's no God like our God. God is the author of healing. God is the author of financial breakthrough. God's the author of peace. God's the author of wholeness. God's the author of health. I can't take it anymore. I just got to praise Him. And he stood up and ran around the building screaming, I'm thankful, I'm thankful, I'm thankful. I'm thankful. In the midst of horrible tragedies, I'm thankful. Well, guess what happened? People started to shout with him, started praising God. Others repented for their hard-heartedness. And a great spirit of renewal swept over that church. Because there's always, always, always something to praise God about. So why don't we just do that? Father, we thank you. Hallelujah. Whatever you, your situation is, be that as it may. Let's go beyond the pain of the moment. Let's just say, God, I thank you. It don't, I don't see the answer, it, it, the victory. I don't see it physically. It has not manifest, but I believe your word. With God, all things are possible. With God, all things are possible. I will not live in the impossibility of it. I will not live in the, uh, the shadow of feeling uh, unequipped. I will not live in the pain of being exhausted and, and down and sick and tired. I'm going to go after you no matter what my body says to me, no matter what my mind says to me, no matter what the people around, the overwhelming unbelief of people in the uh, community or at my work or whoever I'm around. I'm going to believe you 
I'm going to look up to you. I'm going to lift my eyes to you. I'm going to do just exactly what Jesus did. I'm going to look up to heaven, and I'm going to say, thank you, God. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Some of you need to do that right now. You, you need to look up to heaven. You have been looking at your problem. You have been looking at your situation. You have been struggling with it, and there's nowhere in the Scripture that tells you you're supposed to bear that or struggle with that. Cast all your care on Jesus because he cares for you. He cares for you. He cares for you. Father, we release those things to you right now. We release it all to you. You are the author and the finisher of our faith. And we thank you, O oh God, for your mercy and your goodness towards us. In the name of Jesus, amen, amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Well, give glory to God. Hallelujah, Lord, yes, Lord, hallelujah. Give thanks with a grateful heart. Give thanks to the Holy One. Give thanks because He's given Jesus Christ. His Son. And now let the weak say, I am strong. And let the poor say, I am rich. Because of what the Lord has done. With a grateful heart, give thanks to the Holy One. Give thanks because He's given Jesus Christ, His Son. Give thanks. Lord, we thank you today. We thank you today. In Jesus' name. Just give him a praise one more time. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God, you're so good. Praise the Lord. If you're in this room this morning, and those of you watching by uh, media, if you don't know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, today is your day. And I'm just going to ask everyone in this room it, it, just to say these words out with me, out loud with me today. For the sake of anyone in here or the sake of anyone watching, I want you to say these words with me. Dear Heavenly Father, I love you. I give you my heart. I give you my life. I give you my soul. Everything I have, I give to you. I repent of my sins, and I look towards the cross of Calvary for the forgiveness of my sins. And I thank you that you gave your Son, Jesus Christ, for my sins. And now I'm saved, I'm healed, I'm delivered in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Give glory to God. Give glory to God. If you would, before we uh, sign off this morning, I'm going to count to three if you'll say God bless you to all of these dear ones that watch with us. One, two, three. God bless you. We're praying for you, and we love you. You are dismissed this morning. God bless you.